Hey guys, it's Dr. Dan Lieberman, the Medical Director of Phoenix Spine and Joint. And I'm really kind of psyched to be here with you today to talk about a new topic for us, and that is the anti-inflammatory diet. Why are you talking about the anti-inflammatory diet, Dan? You're a neurosurgeon. <laughs> well, the reason is there's a lot of chatter out there about whether or not what you eat can affect your joint pain. And joint pain is a big deal for us. In fact, it's why we're here. Our whole mission is to give you the information you need to manage your spine and joint through healthy living. So it's a big deal. If it works, it would be super cool. And for all you know, it works. Well, let's think about it. It makes a lot of sense. Even the word arthritis, arth, Latin, joint, itis, Latin, inflammation, inflamed joint, right? So if there was something that could reduce inflammation, or if you could prevent the inflammation from being in there in the first place, either one of those things would seem like it could really have an impact on joint pain associated with arthritis. And that's kind of the way I'm thinking about the anti-inflammatory diet world right now is that there's two things. The first is don't eat stuff that's going to cause your joints to get inflamed. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it really does. We know that what we eat, our body reacts to all foreign bodies within our body. And although our intestinal system is outside of our body, still all those Everything we eat is broken down by our teeth, ground up by the acids in, our, in the stomach, and then pulverized as it moves through, and the mic macromolecules taken down and absorbed across the intestine as you go on to digest it until the, the ending that we're all kind of familiar with. But your body's going to react to that. I mean, if you were allergic to something and you ate it, could that affect you? It happens every day. If you're allergic to peanuts and you eat a peanut, you can even have an anaphylactic, a fatal, really dangerous, spooky, scary reaction. So yeah, I mean, it makes total sense that what you eat produces an inflammatory reaction. And we know that some foods react with us more than others. So yeah, I'd have a hard time if someone said, oh, I, you know, uh, I call BS on that. There's no way that what you eat can affect your overall body level of inflammation. Mm, it's not true. Uh, what you eat certainly does produce an inflammatory effect, so it makes sense. The second thing is less, um, less strong in my mind, but definitely interesting and a, an enormous potential. And that is, well, is food medicine? Can we change what we eat and thereby reduce this overall level of inflammation. I mean, there's a lot of reason to think that food could be like medicine, right? In fact, almost all the early medicines came from food, even things like digitalis from the foxglove tree, you know? The, the early medicine, all the medicine, uh, bark was an, uh, an enormous source of early, or early medications. So yeah, I mean, it seems possible the kind of data that we look for though, the nice thing about our actual medications, our actual drugs, is there's great data. There's trials, there's information about the medication, which we can go to, to decide if we think it works. And, and even really simple things like, what's the right dose to take? You know, I'm not a pharmacologist. Uh, if you tell me uh, turmeric, the active, in, you know, the turmeric tea, is uh, an anti-inflammatory, well, that's great, but how much do I need to take? And how am I supposed to take it? Do I drink it, snort it? Like, what, do I, what am I supposed to do? So we have to kind of look at what information is available. And I think it's um, kind of a trial and error situation. If you want to know if something works for you, I would recommend trying it. And if you try it and it works, then I would actually recommend stopping it and seeing if the pain or problem comes back. Only by going on and off something can you sort of convince yourself whether it works for you or not. And we're gonna talk more about that. 
about how you might go about your own trial and error to see what works for you. Because there's a lot of detailed testing that can go on in the world, but in the end of the day, you know, drug trials cost hundreds of millions of dollars. No one's going to do a drug trial on stuff that bark, you know, stuff that's available all over the place. So if we're going to get an answer, it's going to be an answer for ourselves. But it makes sense on a couple levels. First, it makes sense because whole foods are safer than drugs. You know, I would much rather take a turmeric, for example, which is a naturally occurring ground up root. It's balanced by nature. It's, it's, I know it's not poisonous. People have been eating it for generations. That seems a lot safer to me than something that's turned into a powder in a laboratory and uber concentrated and goodness sakes, who knows what's, what's the, the physiology of it, how, how aggressively it could be. And uh, I don't wanna you know, take something that's bad for my body, but it seems like there's a lot of safety in nature and whole foods are just better than chemical compounds when appropriate. Now remember, we're not talking about the, we're talking about wellness and kind of the treatment of everyday stuff. We're not talking about, oh, I tore my ACL. I'm not gonna take turmeric, right? I'm gonna take NSAIDs or I've got a major, major muscle strain. I, I, you know, I can barely move. That's not a time for cinnamon. That's a time for a leaf or ibuprofen or you know something like that. So not treating of injuries, but looking at daily wellness, because the reverse is also true. If you look at medications, for example, NSAIDs, over a long period of time, they really do virtually always become dangerous. I mean, anti-inflammatories, Aleve, Ibuprofen, um, all the salicylate, all these kind of drugs, which we've, you know, people have taken from forever, it seems like. If you look at them over time, they've got some pretty serious side effects. Chronic anti-inflammatory medications cause three huge ones uh, with associated deaths in each category. I mean, for NSAIDs, number one is GI bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding from peptic ulcer disease. It's like five times the risk, but from taking a uh, NSAID and 15 or 20% of all GI bleeds were caused by NSAID. So massive. Uh, kidney failure? Sound, uh, sounds bad to me. I mean, because it, it is. So kidney failure, acute renal failure, very common side effect of NSAIDs. Myocardial infarction, AKA heart attack. Yeah, not, not any worse. Than, doesn't get worse than that unless you consider stroke because uh, that's true too. So, you know, there's some really hefty, 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 heavy duty, really want to avoid potential problems with these medications. All right, so we know our food can cause inflammation, uh, it's common sense, and we also know there's good possibility that food could be used as medicine to reduce our inflammation, or at least we're motivated because we think it could potentially be a lot safer. And we've got a pretty good idea of how to go about it, trial and error. We're not gonna believe all the hooey that we read, right? Because there's not a lot of good data. If there is good data, we're definitely gonna consider it. But for the most part, there's not that great of data. So we're looking at, you know, roaming it alone. I developed an, uh, uh, this uh, infographic to sort of summarize a lot of stuff and maybe give you something you can look at kind of uh, in the mirror, cut out and put on the mirror kind of thing, or, on, or you know, make it the background on your phone, or just go to it periodically. But here's, some, here's my take on what I would recommend you do on an anti-inflammatory diet right now. Um, and it's uh, toast. <laughs> it's as easy as toast. <laughs> Not actual toast, because that would be bad. That would be pro-inflammatory, especially if that toast is made from white bread, the evil white bread. But no, a toast is an acronym like SCUBA, Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. Toast stands for tea oil, Ayurvedic cleanse, statin, and track. Let's go through them one at a time just so you can uh, and there's going to be a lot of future videos. We're going to explain a lot of this in much greater detail. But let me just sort of start out with this. Tea. Um, Anti-inflammatory tea. 
tea has been drunk by people for health for as long as there have been people. I mean, you know, r literally since we crawled out of the uh, out of the water in the amoeba stage, people love tea. And so you just pour hot water over the right ingredients, let it steep for four or five minutes, and you can get some really cool effects. There's a really great anti-inflammatory tea. And of course, you want to just throw in everything that you know of that's anti-inflammatory and then give some consideration to what causes the active anti-inflammatory ingredients to be absorbed, and that's turmeric tea. One of my professors in medical school back in the late 80s, early 90s was Dr. Andrew Weil. Andy, uh, Dr. Andy Weil went on to be really one of the kind of uh, main voices in America for alternative medicine. But he was a super cool lecturer, really smart uh, guy, uh, had this long beard. I used to, uh, I felt like it was, he was like Moses. <laughs> you know, he would come in there. Uh, really cool guy, great instructor. But he has a really nice uh, video on how to make turmeric tea. Basically, you put in turmeric, uh, half teaspoon, ginger. You can grind it on a, a grater, grate it out so that you get some, get it so it'll um, the surface area around the water is high. Lemon, lemon makes everything better and lemon in hot water is good for you. A couple shakes of pepper, a couple turns of your pepper mill because the pepper is not for taste here. It, you know, it wouldn't fit with these other things. The pepper is to increase the absorption and uh, there are some studies which seem to indicate that you absorb the turmeric maybe a thousand times better with a little bit of pepper. It's also the case that uh, turmeric is fat soluble. If you take it in water, it's gonna be hard for your body to absorb, so put in a little fat. I'll put in uh, just a little tiny dollop of ghee. You could also make your turmeric tea and add some cream to it, so just, just some kind of fat to stir in there to make it go down. Remember how we're gonna do, there's great articles in the literature on turmeric and turmeric tea as an anti-inflammatory. Turmeric also is just, just the bomb. It's, 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 it's anti-everything that's bad for you. It helps you control your blood sugar, anti-diabetic. It literally stops uh, cancer cells from dividing in vitro, whether it does anything significant in vivo is hard to know, but people have used it for generations as millennia actually, as an anti-neoplastic, as chemotherapy. Um, and it's definitely anti-inflammatory, so uh, it's definitely something you should try. I would recommend uh, trying turmeric tea, half a teaspoon a, or more, or one or two shots of that a day. You can drink it iced or you can drink it um, hot and see if it helps. Um, I know I myself uh, took uh, started turmeric tea and uh, was absolutely stunned. I woke up the day after I started it with absolutely no stiffness in my entire body. I got an old knee injury. It was just like it never happened. I mean, I felt like I de-aged 10 years. Prove anything? No, of course not, but interesting, right? So then I went a day without it, and uh, yeah, I woke up kind of usual 56-year-old doctor, heavy middle-aged dude, with uh, pain in my knee and you know stiff back and blah blah blah, went back on it, went away. So I uh, definitely made a difference, and um, it's really not bad tasting. So uh, certainly worthwhile. Toast, turmeric tea. Now let's talk about the O. The O stands for oil, and in this case, it's fish oil. There is a lot of nutritional information of the beneficial effects as an anti-inflammatory, also for cardio reducing cardiovascular events, to fish oil. And it's not all fish. It's the oily fish, the ones nobody likes, like sardines. Thankfully, salmon, which a lot of people like, actually. Salmon is uh, one of the beneficial ones. A lot of people, for a lot of people, you'd have to get three to five servings of oily fish in your diet a week for this to work. And that's great, especially if you like fish or you're a seal or whatever. But if uh, if you're not that into fish, you know, maybe you even won't eat fish, then you can get capsules. And my own approach would be do both. Every day that you don't get a fish serving in your diet, pop a couple capsules. 
So you're gonna get the oil one way or another. If you can get it as a whole food, as natural fish, that just seems better, so do that. Turmeric tea, fish oil. Number three, Ayurvedic cleanse, T-O-A, A for Ayurvedic. The, what medicine, like I practiced, like uh, medical doctor medicine, is called allopathic medicine. And that's what I grew up believing in. That's what most people in America, you know, we're allopathic. Uh, we're, we're al our culture identifies, if, if someone talks about medicine, they're talking about allopathic medicine, unless they've said otherwise. There was a time in our country where we uh, kind of flirted with homeopathic medicine. Homeopathic medicine was the idea that if you dilute something way, 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 way down, you could take in tiny concentration of it and that would have a therapeutic effect. The idea of homeopathy is not super consistent with the idea of something we call chemistry. <laughs> That's bogus. So, I mean, it's when I say it's bogus, I mean the way we understand things, we meaning most Americans, allopathic doctors, it's, there's, no, there's no validity to it. We, it even kind of got a special phrase for bad name and that's snake oil, like snake oil salesman homeopathic BS. We don't believe in it, or most of us don't believe in it. But there's a uh, ton of data on it. And so I would really, uh, uh, excuse me, but other cultures have their own ideas, their own systems of medicine. In India, the system of medicine is called Ayurveda. Ayurveda, that's the A in toast. And Ayurveda is really cool. It's, it's, it breaks down what they call doshas, that people have different kind of like fire, air, water, you know, uh, pitta, kaptha, theta, whatever. I don't, I don't know, I don't speak Sanskrit, but th they've got these ideas that there are essences and these essences live in balance. Uh, sound familiar? Balance, you know, Oprah, everybody's talking about balance and that um, if you're imbalanced, you get ill. If you're balanced, that's the way to get back to it. I don't know, doesn't matter to me, but the um, Ayurveda has been around for thousands of years and they've tested the hell out of this stuff. There's people been trying it and, pr and improving it and adding to it. And so there's an intense amount of knowledge there of wisdom and it's accumulated over the years. Is the science right? Definitely not, but it's not science. You know, they, it was the pre-scientific method, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. And so it's worth trying. There's a great book called Clean by Alejandro Junger, J-U-N-G-E-R. I put a link in the infographic to get this book on Amazon. And Clean is a three week Ayurvedic cleanse. If three weeks makes you react in horror and think, oh my God, I would never do that. Well, how about seven days? I mean, it's one third is good because it really does take some time, but there is a, a seven day version, which is called clean seven or something like that. You can Google it yourself and find it. But the, the reason to do an Ayurvedic cleanse is to kind of like, you know, we need results. We're Americans, we need results. So you could get started on this whole process really well, really quickly with a three week Ayurvedic cleanse or at least a one week Ayurvedic cleanse. And then something really cool happens. The, these are restrictive diets where everything un, under the sun that's known to be inflammatory is restricted from your diet. And then you're gonna feel great. You're gonna feel like a million bucks. I, I can virtually guarantee it. And when that happens to you, you should convince yourself, oh my gosh, whatever you feel now and whatever you feel in that third week of the Ayurvedic cleanse when you're gonna feel a, like a million bucks, that's how much your food is affecting you. So that's, that's a good thing to know, right? When we started this out and I said, well, how much does your food affect you? Or can, can food, you're probably, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Well, that's how you find out, you test it out. At the end of that third week, you can start adding stuff back if you start adding back dairy and you have an enormous increase in gas, you feel bloated, you feel crapola like you do now before you get on this toast plan, then you're probably lactose intolerant or some version of that. 
And that's the issue. So don't go back to dairy. If meat is what screws you up, you added back dairy, never noticed anything. You added back meat and you're miserable. Guess what? You need to go veggie from then on. Or what if it was gluten? You know, you don't have to have gluten intolerance or the disease to actually be a little bit, you know, a little shady with gluten. You'll find out. You'll know when you eliminate everything for three weeks and then you come back to it. That's, that's how you find out, trial and error. All right, turmeric tea, yum, no morning stiffness, feeling good. Fish oil, uh, you know, trying to hit my three salmon or sardines or whatever um, a week, but when I can't, I just pop a couple fish oil tablets, which you can get in any drugstore. Did my three-week Ayurvedic cleanse. Skin's amazing, hair's growing great, feel terrific, lost 10, 15, maybe 20 pounds, love and life. What's next? Well, if you want to take it to the next level, it's being on a statin. Lipitor, Crestor, statins uh, are drugs that are some of the most common medications in America. They are dirty drugs. They can cause muscle problems. They can cause a hundred other side effects. So you don't go into them lightly. I think the reason to consider a statin, I would say you should consider it. And what I mean by that is lower your threshold for taking it. So if your doctor's been trying to get you on a statin because she does your blood work and your um, cholesterol is high, just do it because statins are anti-inflammatory medications, strong anti-inflammatory medications. A lot of the chemicals, a lot of the proteins that um, in, are involved in inflammation relate to the liver where the statin affects your cycle. So it's just very strong anti-inflammatory effect of the statins. It's not just for cholesterol, it's also for inflammation. So definitely something to think about. All right, you've done your turmeric tea, you've, you're, you're banging your oil like you should, or your capsules, finished your Ayurvedic cleanse, your beast, maybe you should do that three weeks the first quarter of every year. You made up your mind, you talked it over with your doctor, decided if the statin was for you or not. It's all great, right? No. You're wasting your time. If you did all that stuff, you're gonna feel like a million bucks. You're gonna to say to yourself, why did I ever go off that cleanse? I just felt so good. Why didn't, you know, but it's all gonna end and you're gonna go back to what you've always done, you loser. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna stick. It never does. And the reason is really, really something that Peter Drucker defined for us. You cannot solve a problem the greatest management thinker in history told us, until you measure it. Until you've got a parameter to go after, it's just not, you're just gonna go back to normal. So we need to track and control the changes that we made. That's the other T, by the way, in toast. That's the last T. And the way we track is basically by tracking three things. The first one is simple, your weight. Weigh yourself. I hate weighing myself. I, I've always been fat my whole life. I, I just, I hate weighing myself, but you gotta do it. You cannot solve a problem you cannot, you don't measure. You, and my saying for that is you get the performance that you manage toward and measure consistently. Measure consistently. So weigh yourself. You don't have to weigh yourself every day. You don't have to weigh yourself every hour. Don't be OCD about it. Give it some time, you know, whatever it is gonna be though, whether it's a week, or a month, and there's a lot of apps on your phone. Record your weight in the app so that you can uh, have it long-term and, and know what's going on with you. Number two is CRP, C, another acronym, C-reactive protein. You have to track your C-reactive protein. It's your blood level that tells you how much inflammation you have going on. Well, we're trying to reduce inflammation, so if you did, you should see your CRP go down. If it didn't go down, you didn't do anything. You need, to, you need to bang harder. Maybe take more of those fish oil capsules. Ayurvedic tea, go on that three-week cleanse. You bomb, you only did one week. You should have done three. So there's a lot of stuff you can do, which, uh, which, which is gotta be measured. You know, your doctor, doesn't, your doctor doesn't make suggestions to you and then never check anything, right? If you're sick, what do they do? They check your blood. They, they get a number you can work against. They, they give you a parameter, and that's what we're trying to do here. And then the third thing I would recommend is that you do track what you eat. 
Look, if you're eating, if you're on an anti-inflammatory diet, you're going to learn really quickly that fruits, vegetables, 99% of the foods are fine. And you're also going to eat some crap that you shouldn't have eaten. It's just inevitable. You're going to have a sandwich and you're going to eat some white bread. And so I would recommend instead of tracking all the food that you should eat, which is 99% of it, just track the stuff you weren't supposed to eat. It, it might keep you, it, first of all, the fact that you know you're gonna have to track it tells you don't eat it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna put that down. So, and if I do eat it, I'm not gonna eat very much. So just the act of tracking, it's that Heisenberg uncertainty principle is gonna be a positive step in the right direction. The second reason to track is it might surprise you. There's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat if you're doing one thing a day that's 500 calories, that's preventing you from losing a pound a week. Not that we should try to like track all our calories and figure, you know, that's, all that crap's been proven again and again and again not to work. So if you just wanna be insane and do what we know doesn't work, go ahead and do it, but don't waste my time. But if you wanna do uh, a, a trackable change as part of a change in pattern, I think that's a really good thing. All right, listen, start with toast, uh, T-O-A-S-T. It's really cool. I put links in all of the um, all of the letters which can connect you with stuff. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to become a monk over this. Like, just do some of it. It's all good for you. And the more you do, the better you're going to do. There's a crap ton of information on the web about the anti-inflammatory diet. I'm posting stuff all the time, AED, anti-inflammatory diet, AID, anti-inflammatory diet, AIDS, anti-inflammatory diet, on Phoenix Spine and Joint Facebook. It bleeds over video-wise into our um, Instagram, and you can catch some of this stuff on our YouTube. So check it out, follow along, track your progress, uh, hit me up if you have questions, even uh, also if you have any good ideas, and look, we'll be doing um, more videos to come on how to make this stuff work for you. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.